Hello and welcome to episode 14 of Talking Shop with Tony Abbey. My name is David Quinn, Chief Marketing Officer at NAFEMS, and I'll be your host for today. This series is a part of the wider community program of online events that NAFEMS is delighted to be bringing you. You can see more details on the website and hopefully find something else of interest as well. This week, Tony's covering dynamic response. We'll kick off with a 30 minute presentation, then open things up to your questions and comments. You can submit your questions by using the Q&A box, which is accessed via the cartoon question mark on your screen. We'll then go through a selection of these at the end of the session. So without wasting any more time, I'll hand you over to Tony. Thank you very much, David. And first off, um, I apologize for it's been a little while since the, the last uh, talking shop. And I also have to catch up on the videos. So a little bit of um, uh, slap on the wrist there. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get that done. Uh, I know many of you, um, I had a complaint from somebody who said, I can't get up at five o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles just to listen to the videos, so just to listen to the, the webinar. So I'm sorry, the recordings are due and uh, I, know, um, I, know they'll be, I know they'll be welcome. So we'll do that. So the title is uh, Dynamic Response Shocking to Random. And I actually have a shocking um, uh, confession to make. Let me just get my um, bouncing ball up which is always a bit of a struggle. Um, it helps if I pass you the ball, Tony. I haven't done that yet. Okay. Like, We've been talking so much. We, I know, we're talking about Yorkshire tea. There you go. Right. Now we're, now we're in business. Now, okay. WebEx has kind of changed the, the layout, as David was saying. But anyway, uh, first off, the confession. Um, I couldn't fit random analysis in this week. I do apologize. By the time I've finished talking about frequency response and shock response, there just wasn't enough enough room left. So random uh, next time, I promise. Uh, and then we can focus a bit more on that. So uh, David's looking really uh, annoyed with me because, you know, marketing guys, we like to, uh, he likes to, to make sure that we've got the right thing. Um, so I'm um, going to talk about motivation for the talk. Why, why am I talking about this? Well, um, in the teaching I do, um, the courses, and um, just dealing with people in general, uh, consultancy on dynamic analysis, Transient analysis is, is very intuitive. We're going to hit something, shake it, and we see the response through time. We plot it. Everything's pretty well defined in the input and the output. And then we come to frequency response. Well, why are we going to frequency-based calculation? Why is the output so confusing? And then with shock spectra, where do the shock spectra come from, and how do we apply the shock spectra? So um, it was prompted by some questions coming up on the intro to dynamics course and also the advanced dynamics course. I realize that sometimes maybe you can just stand back a little bit and look at the difference between these types of analysis. And again, I'd hope to fit random in, but that's just a little bit to, to kind of chew off there. They're packing too much into my suitcase. So let's um, move on to a quick plug. Um, you know that one of my, um, my mantras, my, my nagging mode is don't forget to do a modal survey if you're doing dynamic analysis. This is basically a backbone to pretty well anything you're going to do. So we're going to do um, a quick, uh, or look, have a quick look at a frequency response analysis using this particular structure here. It's a tray type structure or support structure. There's a, there's a payload mass at the bottom here, and we can connect it to ground, uh, just a simple um, center point here. We're the rigid spider. <laughs> Where is Spider-Man? So here's the first uh, three modes, and I've got, usually get a, a table of modes in there. So just a, a kind of reminder, if you don't do a modal survey, don't get a feel for what these modes are about, then, then really you're kind of flying blind. So let's get on to the first uh, response type we're going to look at now, which is frequency response analysis. What, what is that all about? Well, it's about sustained oscillatory excitation. Something is driving our structure, and it just continues to drive. And it's driving at a particular um, range of frequencies, um, or maybe we're just exploring the response to a range of frequencies. So we've got rotating machinery. Out of balance on your tire, if you've got an out of balance, this happened to all, in the old days a lot. Um, one of these weights would come off. You're driving down the freeway or the motorway, and you've got this, this shaking going on, but it's continuous you know, for maybe four or five miles or until you change speed or something. So the idea, it's not transitory. It doesn't come and go. It's pretty well on forever. This old helicopter here, um, actually, this is a modern, more modern version of one I worked on many, many years ago, one of my first dynamic challenges was actually there was a torpedo slung underneath this thing. And we've got the passing bade frequency, which is hammering down. 
So we've got, again, this continuous excitation, uh, oscillatory excitation. We assume it's a harmonic type of excitation. And we want to know the response to that. Now here would be at, say, um, the N uh, speed of the blades, and then 2N, 3N, 4N. But it might be we want to explore a whole range of different uh, input speeds. Like on the tire, we might want to look at, well, what happens as we change speed up and down? The whip aerial here, or sorry, the aerial here, you, you pull this thing out, it's telescopic. And I do remember many years ago uh, having one of these, and very, these are very old on my car. It got eye secretion on it, and I watched as uh, it got into a perfect aerodynamic shape and mass. And this thing was then being driven by my wind speed, or uh, well, the speed of the car, and it got into a steady state oscillation. And unfortunately, uh, fatigue then fairly rapidly took over. So all sorts of applications where we want to know what is the dynamic response to this sustained uh, oscillatory type of input motion. Uh, so it's a very specific type of, of loading, dynamic loading we're talking about. One of the best analogies is a vibration test setup. Think of um, like a, um, a shaker table. We're going to put something on that shaker table. And how would we operate that shaker table? We'd put the equipment on there, and then we're going to go through a frequency response range, which means we're going to start perhaps with a low frequency, say 20 hertz. We're going to drive the um, equipment at 20 hertz, and we have to let it settle down so that it, there, it builds up its response at 20 hertz to whatever level of acceleration, say, we're putting in there, a settle down. We see the response at 20 hertz, so that's what we call steady state. So we get the steady state peak response at each driving frequency. Then we change frequency to, say, 55 hertz and so on, and all the way up to, say, maybe 2,000 hertz. In the analysis world, we're very lucky. We can just say, we call out, this is like a sine sweep. Let's go from 50 to 2,000 hertz. And it doesn't take any more energy for us because basically it's just a virtual system. You go to a test engineer and say, here's a heavy piece of equipment. You just drive it from 50 to 1,000 hertz or 2,000 hertz. Then uh, uh, you know, it takes a lot of power to drive things at the top end there. So we can be shaking. And that's analogous to base motion and a, a structural component. We connect it down to ground. Or we can actually be uh, putting in, I call it like a stinger. So in here, the, again, there's a rotary piece of equipment. Well, actually, there's um, an axial piece of equipment here, which is pumping up and down here. And it's actually stinging um, or, or putting an excitation into that aileron there. And I did this for um, a couple of light aircraft, but using a much cruder kind of rotary uh, stinger in here. And basically, the idea is you drive that stinger through the range. And you're looking to see, uh, again, you settle down, you're looking to see resonances of, in this particular case, coupling between the aileron, uh, the stiffness of the aileron connection in there, and potentially this torsional and, and bending stiffness uh, frequencies of the wing. So um, we're either going to be shaking it or hitting it, basically. And uh, again, it's a sustained uh, approach that we're taking there. It's a sustained type of loading. <clears throat> so on the, coming to the kind of the analysis side, um, just think of a single degree of freedom system. We're going to be, we've got our stiffness, we've got our mass, and now we've got a, a damping coming in. And we're driving it. We're driving it with a particular driving input frequency, omega. So omega isn't a natural frequency. It's, it's our range of frequencies. So we can hit that with any frequency we like. So from 50 hertz up to 2,000 hertz, anything we, we care to do. Now, one of the questions is, well, why do you go to the frequency domain? That's a bit of a pain. It's difficult to understand perhaps what it means, the frequency domain. Well, if we ran a transient, we could certainly do that. So we ran a transient here. We've done that here. And we build up to a steady state response. What's happening with this buildup is that there's an energy dissipation due to the damping, but there's an energy input due to the excitation we're applying, either the shaking or the stinging. And we get to this steady state response. We get a particular amplitude, say displacement amplitude, a steady state. At that point, everything's kind of settled down. That's analogous on the shaker table to just waiting that period of time till we got that, that level steady state response. Now, instead of doing it that way, I could run, um, let's say I had, um, say, 100 uh, datum points on my shaker table. I could run an analogy of that and do 100 transients. But that would be very painful, and we're not interested in the transitory period here, just the steady state. So we're going to take a shortcut to that and do a frequency response analysis. The mathematics is simpler. We, we cut out any, everything other than that peak sustained uh, response. So this graph in here is exactly the same uh, calculation, except we could just have one. Uh, if I drive at the resonant frequency, I get my amplitude here. 
and I get my amplitude uh, up in here, the steady state response amplitude. That that little line there should be, a little, I can move up to the top here. So that um, is a one, the, the transient is like a one shot, one one event. The frequency response is a range of events, and we can choose what our driving input uh, levels are. We can keep this as a, as a flat line and do a sine sweep. Or there might be a, a spectrum coming from somebody to say, well, our operational case, this is the typical range of driving uh, forces as a function of frequency. So it doesn't have to be a flat line. So it is a straight, um, it's the same physics, but in, in one frequency response analysis, I can look at 100 <clears throat> points on my spectrum on my envelope very, very quickly rather than diving into uh, each one as a transient, where I'm throwing away a lot of this information. Now, because of that, I do lose some of the uh, physical uh, direct meaning, the in intuition. I get out a magnitude, which is the plot here, and corresponding to that should also be a phase plot. So we split the responses into magnitude and phase, or if you're um, uh, a control guy, then real and imaginary. So that is a complexity, but we just kind of have to kind of accept that. So here's a little example. I'm going to do a unit sign sweep. Um, this is, again, the tray that we talked about. So we know the modes of this tray, little payload in here. And I'm going to sting or drive at that particular payload. And I've canted the load off to be um, in X, Y, and Z so that it'll pick up the, um, all the modes. Um, if I just had a vertical input and I cut out a lot of the modes. So this is analogous now to put this on a stinger, some sort of driving at, the, at that particular orientation with that force and I put a unit sign sweep on there well what's what's the point of doing that it doesn't represent anything particularly it's really looking at the sensitivity of that structure to a particular frequency response I'm really understanding more about the structural characteristics across a range of potential driving frequencies that tells me what I should avoid uh, what I should uh, try and design to, to to design out particular frequencies try and stiffen things up and so on it gives me a lot of information as I say, I might change that to a particular series of slopes and curves, which represent a spectrum. Somebody um, has gathered a lot of information, test data, and can put it into that way. So it can be either um, a straight sine sweep or a, a, a particular loading spectrum. So here's the frequency response analysis, and I picked the, um, the, the little mass point in here. We just see it peeking out there and plotting response uh, here. Now, it's a log-log scale, which, again, is, is a bit confusing. Why do we do that? Well. I've got up to 1,000 hertz here. In fact, I went all the way to 2,000. So I'm going from 1 to 1,000. So to kind of compress everything onto one scale, uh, log log is useful there. And here I've got log log to just get some sense of sensitivity. I'm often interested in the, the null points, the kind of the dwell points, as well as the peaks. So this kind of um, brings everything in together at the same time. And the first thing I do, um, having done a good modal survey, is to check to make sure I see my modes occurring in my frequency response. And that's exactly what, what we've done there. So this is like an overall picture of that frequency response analysis. First stage, check the frequency content. We can also check to see that our damping is right by actually looking at the peak response in here compared to the, uh, to the input. Um, so here's two modes. I'm, I'm particularly checking to see if that's what's going on, checking the sense. And again, um, this mode one is basically shuffling off in the Y direction, the Y direction here. So there's mode number one, and that's exactly what it's doing. The contribution in the y-axis is doing that. It's not interested in the z or the x-axis, very little action there. Come to mode two, and now it's shuffling in the x-direction. So it's basically um, in the, um, I'm sorry, in the z-direction. I'm looking at that, thinking that doesn't make sense. In the z-direction here, so it's moving up and down the z-direction. That's the dominant one. It's trailing a little bit with a little bit in X, which is coming this way, which makes sense. But again, it's a log scale, so it's a long way behind. So again, just this quick modal survey, things look good. Um, and finally, mode three, which is like a funny axial mode, because we've got a larger mass in here, kind of shunts along uh, in here. And again, the frequency response is picking that up nicely. And we see uh, mode three, and it's dominated by that X direction. Uh, term in there. So great, we've we've done a comparison of the um, um, of the frequency response content against the uh, the, the normal modes. But now we, we, it's not. We, we can look at the frequency response now. And this was mode number one, which was 108 hertz. Now I've done a plot of the frequency response. So this is now driving. And one of the questions is: Is it the same shape? 
Well, we've got a couple of things going on in here which would make things awkward when we're trying to interpret frequency response. First off, magnitude and phase has to be imagined. And this side and the mode is going up. This side is going down. And I can plot the mode shape just as um, I can think of as displacements. They're not really, but it's going to be an actual positive, positive and negative values. Coming out of the frequency response analysis is just magnitude. So it's a bit confusing. So this side has gone up like that goes up. But instead of that going down, I've got to pick an absolute value. So that's gone up as well. So I've got this strange kind of bend in this here. It is actually fundamentally the same shape, but I've got to basically think about um, the phasing in here. And that can be quite tricky, as we'll see a little bit later on. Interpreting a frequency response um, uh, plot is not easy. In this particular post-processor, I can actually combine the uh, x, y, and z directions. Sometimes you can't. So it becomes a little bit difficult to kind of figure out exactly what's going on. Um, just as an aside, we also uh, just, well, really to emphasize that point, here's a different structure. It's plate num mode number one at 30.3 hertz. That's its natural frequency response and output. This is the frequency response point. And again, we've got that situation here. There's a nodal line there where there's no motion. This is a down going. The magnitude can't show me that. It's all going to be positive. So I get this weird fold in the plate like that. That's essentially what's happening back in here as well. Instead of being able to go up and down, you get this kind of strange, sort of almost like a phantom type of mode. It's just completely um, numerical nonsense, if you like. It's just a visual nonsense. But we have to kind of interpret it that way. Um, we can also uh, really kind of uh, show that as what's happening, because 270 degrees is red, and then 90 degrees uh, is pale blue. The relative phase in between those is 180 degrees. So I found this cartoon here. We've got one half of the elevator going up, and the other half of the elevator going down, which is kind of what's happening here. We like to be able to have up and down, but we can only have up, if you like. So that's our, that's our magnitude um, shown in, in here. But the corresponding phase diagram tells us, OK, that's magnitude, and this is phase. This is why I was talking about the, um, the results out of frequency response analysis can be somewhat confusing. We have to think magnitude and phase. And I'm afraid it's just something we kind of have to drill down and kind of get used to. It gets bad. It gets horrible. <laughs> this is mode 13 of the plate. And this is actually the mode shape. And it's actually, um, uh, again, positive and negative because it's just showing me an eigenvector or mode shape. Now we look at the frequency response at the same uh, driving frequency now. It's obviously picking up this mode. This mode dominates. And look at this crazy plot. This is magnitude. This is phasing. And I, oh, I could pick my way through this, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, I've had to do that on projects to try and explain um, if there's test results or physically what on earth does this mean? What does your frequency response plot mean there? So we've got over that issue. Um, we've got over the issue of, OK, we've got phase and magnitude to think about. Um, but here in mode two, is it the same shape as um, mode two and then the frequency response at 129.8? Well, there's another thing we need to think about. They're not actually that they're not they're no longer um, uh, mode shapes. They're no longer eigenvectors. They're actually displacement responses at that particular dri driving frequency, which is going to be very, very heavily influenced by the modal, uh, the resonant frequencies there. But it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same as it. If we think about it, we've got this frequency number one, 108.4 hertz. This at 129.8. Um, here we can see that the modes are fairly close together, but they're in different directions. So there's not too much um, cross-linking between them. In the middle here, we can actually see this is somewhat in the middle here. This is the frequency response plot as we transition from this shape to this shape. So it's kind of fun, and it's interesting to animate, freq animate frequency response plots through the frequency range to see how one mode shape morphs into another mode shape. And if this was um, a structure which had closely shaped modes, let's say, and two bending modes, say first order bending mode and second order bending mode, and they were closely shaped there, there'd be a contribution from that mode and that mode, or, or let's say the blue line would have a contribution from the red line at the same time. So that's going to change the shape of the response. So it doesn't necessarily have to match exactly the, the mode response. And that's kind of an important point. They're well separated they will pretty well replicate the mode shape. 
if they're closely together, it's going to be a mixture of those those merge shapes. So again, that kind of makes it all very interesting. So um, some points there pulled out of uh, frequency response, and I hope I, I kind of went through the thought of well things things that uh, have always bugged me in the past, and kind of things I just kind of highlight. It's not really a teaching on frequency response. As a little hint, we've got uh, another intro to dynamics class coming up uh, fairly shortly. And uh, again, that's that's the place to, to get a little bit more background on this. Then I want to talk also about shock spectra analysis. Now, this is a different type of a physical event now. Instead of the continuous uh, harmonic type of loading environment, what we've now got is that uh, single or a set of known time histories. So say we've got a shock event here, and I did a lot of work with US Navy DDAM method, the dynamic design analysis method, where we basically, a lot of shock tests, a lot of, uh, well, mainly shock tests, some calculation, and basically can, can we shock hard and can we survive all the components on the ship here? Um, and basically um, here, if we could do a transient, we, and we could do a transient, but again, um, it, it's going to be a short, sharp event now, not this sustained event. Um, it could last a few milliseconds, such as something like this. It could be a longer duration event, such as the heavy shaking period of an earthquake, or a bump in a car um, going over a rough road, and maybe that event of that individual bump is going to take maybe 10, 15 seconds. It might be shorter. But basically, we want to get a whole load of different uh, transient inputs, tests, analysis, because there's not going to be just one event here. There's not going to be one standoff distance one orientation of the ship, and so on. There's going to be many. So we want to em embrace the same kind of idea as the frequency response, really. We want to embrace a wide range of potential shocks. So if we look at transportation um, spe uh, response, shock respect, uh, response spectrum, um, let's say military transportation, ground transportation, there's a lot of evidence, a lot of test evidence. That's built up into this spectrum. So it's, again, less reliance on an individual transient it's more an emphasis on the family of inputs. So um, hence the term shock or response spectra, and again, to cover uh, a family uh, of events. And there are two things we can, we, two stages we can think of in, in a shock spectra. We can actually generate the sp shock spectra. Now that's not often required in, in practice, in my experience. It's usually somebody gives us a spectra. So for example, here's a, and I stress, this is a hypothetical uh, DDAM naval shock spectra. And we've got basically, if we look at the skewed axis, which is the 45 degree axis, that's the acceleration axis against frequency. So we've got a, a building uh, term in here. So the acceleration's building, and then we have a constant period over here. That's very typical, a lot of uh, shock spectra. Um, at low uh, frequency ranges, um, our structure is basically going to be um, um, a frequency dependent. So we can get some alleviation in here. Um, at the high frequency uh, end there, it it's picks up the full kind of pseudo-static type of loading. So we'll we talk about very briefly generating a spectra, but again, it might be something you never do, but it's useful to know how that's done, and then applying a spectra. David, I see you're kind of looking poised perhaps to do um, a poll. Is that is that a good time to, to mention this? And maybe we, can, we could do it. I don't know if you've, if anyone's tuned in and heard Tony and I talking about wheelbarrows over over the past fourteen episodes, but it's, it's a bit of a thing. Uh, Tony was talking about doing a talking shop on and analysing a wheelbarrow. Uh, so I'm going to open a poll. So if you look on your right hand side of the screen, you will hopefully see a poll there. And uh, if you can start voting, would you be interested in a talking shop about Tony's wheelbarrows? I've got to talk this up, David, because people are yeah, laughing at you're talking about. So basically, I've just had four grueling days uh, shifting rock in wheelbarrows, and I broke two of them. And I was able to actually assess, field test these two wheelbarrows, and they both have their strengths and literally their weaknesses, and the one I hate and one I love. And so I thought, there's a lot of physics in here, torsional stiffness, uh, strength, um, Kinematics, a lot, a lot of stuff in there. Uh, okay, I'm an engineer. I apologize. I get excited about things like this. So we could do a, a talk based around the physics associated with uh, a, a particular, um, uh, what do you call it, consumer product. There we go. There you go. And I think it's 
overwhelmingly, Tony. There's only three people who have said they don't want to see that Talking Shop episode, which is, I'd like to know, well, I do know who those three people are, so uh, I'll be knocking on your door fairly soon. <laughs> Is one but, <laughs> uh, probably, probably. <laughs> uh, but yeah, overwhelmingly, people would be interested in seeing that Talking Shop. You've got 10 seconds to vote. Another two people saying they're not interested. Boo. I, I can't wait to hear about your wheelbarrows, actually. Okay. Okay. But, but yeah, that's that's the poll closed. 73 out of 135 people, so half of the people online responded. And overwhelmingly, yeah, over almost 100% of you want to see that talking shop. So We will working. make that happen. We will make that happen. A talking shop on wheelbarrows. That's probably unique, but there we go. <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> okay. So anyway, carry on with the shock. Thank you for that, David. So thank you on with the carrying on with the uh, the shock spectra work. Then we know that we can generate the spectra, create the spectra in some way, but then mostly we're going to be applying the spectra. So creating a spectra, how do we go about that? Well, again, back to our little bracket here. We've got the payload, let's say, at this position here, and it might be I want to put some equipment on there, some lightweight equipment on there, and I want to know what's the loading environment I'm going to see there. So again, the same idea. We could be run a range of vertical transients in here. So this can be our actual kind of um, operational environment we see, our loading environment. But then over here, at that point in there, how do I characterize that? Well, if I run, say, 10 transients, I've got 10 sets of transient information at that particular point. But it's difficult to explain to somebody, uh, as like a de design requirement, to, to how, how should I design my component at that particular point? So the idea then of the shock spectra approach is to basically say, um, let's let's have some way of measuring response at that particular point there, or the um, well, it's going to be the spectrum at that particular point. So here I've run um, actually it was a half sine impulse in here uh, as a single transient, and typically you would run many transients. And over here I put a particular um, a bunch of springs and masses. The springs and masses are tuned at one hertz, two hertz, and so on up to five hertz. Now, this is analogous to the old days. The shock spectra equipment would be uh, a drum rotating around with um, um, pens on uh, little spring mass systems, which would oscillate. So the drum, drum would kind of rotate, um, move down this way, and everything would oscillate. So under this loading, we see that the 1 hertz pen, if you like, gives us me a peak there. The 2 hertz pen gives me a peak there. And so on, all the way down to 5 hertz uh, pen gives me a peak there. So we've, what we can do is to take these transients and strip out anything else other than the absolute maximum value there. And that's essentially what we do. So if I then replot that, I can actually plot a spectrum to represent what's happening at that particular point. So here's my spectrum. These were the peak points. And now I can change it into the peak acceleration against the frequency I've picked up. Now, this isn't a fast Fourier transform or a Fourier transform, which sometimes people think it is. It's actually... It's a, a, a peak response to, to, uh, of a single degree of freedom system, a, a whole series of single degree of freedom systems. The application here is now I've got my spectrum. So that was generating my spectrum. The application now is to say, well, I'm going to tell somebody you can put a piece of electronic equipment on here, say, but it's got to be able to survive. If you've got a, your resonant frequency is 3.5 hertz of your system, then you've got to be able to supply, um, you've got to be able to survive 1.4 G. So it becomes a design tool in many ways. Um, we can actually say this is the equipment we propose. Is it going to be okay? Now that's just a single degree of freedom, uh, one frequency. A couple of things here. There's no coupling assumed between what I've called the primary structure and the substructure. So this response in here assumes anything I attach, by the mass must be relatively small. And I mustn't stiffen up the primary structure. And that's an important um, concept. If you find yourself doing shock spectra analysis, you're putting a very heavy, stiff structure on what would have been um, uh, some relatively um, unstiff structure, then that, that's not going to work. So there's this weird decoupling between uh, the primary and secondary, which is, again, an important thing to think about. Now, we've got one transient here. Um, typically, um, and that's given us one spectra. We could typically run a whole bunch of transients, so I just kind of scribbled them on here. And one of my jobs at one point was to broaden and envelope these spectra. And lo and behold, we end up with the black line, which is like the definitive shock spectra. So anybody wanting to um, you, uh, come on board my equipment, might be a satellite, might be a car, might be a, um, 
uh, a rocket, whatever it might be, this is the envelope we're going to work with. Now we can also run, because we're running transients, we can run with different uh, damping levels. And so this is representing different levels of damping coming through, through, through the primary structure there. We're shocking in there. So now applying a shock spectra, um, we have seen the application, a very simple application with a single degree of freedom. What happens when we got more than that? Well, here's um, a plate. We're going to shake the plate up and down here. It would be a shock loading going into the plate. This is the shock spectrum, which is basically a triangular uh, buildup or a sloping buildup and then a constant uh, section. We'll have a look at that shortly. And the idea is that I want to get a component in here which will survive um, 18G under the shock loading that we see in here. So as 10G goes in um, at the what we call the plateau, we've got a corner frequency of 300 hertz. So again, we assume it's very light electronic component. The component I put here is not going to be stiffening up um, this the response of this uh, this component of this um, of this plate. This is the the rather nasty equation, um, and I debated whether to put this in. But the ingredients are essentially a normal modes analysis. From a normal modes analysis, we get a thing called the participation factor that tells us mode by mode and degree of freedom by degree degree of freedom for a base motion. How much does that um, that mode in that direction participate? Uh, and it is strictly for base motion. So we can do some equations to calculate that. That's what we use. How much does each mode participate? The input acceleration comes from my shock table. So this is coming externally. And this is the particular mode frequency I'm working at. Now, this is the curious thing. Off the normal modes analysis, I can pick the deflected shape, which is really the eigenvector shape. So I pick the corner um, deflection, if you like, or mode shape of my plate. Normally, we'd say, well, that's meaningless because it's arbitrary. Well, if we put it through this process of base motion, it actually becomes a, a physical response. We can actually take any output from the uh, normal mode analysis. We could ask for stresses. Um, and then going through this exact same process, I can get, actually get a response stress out at that particular mode. Now, because I'm asking for an acceleration, there's a little bit of a nice shortcut here. If I um, differentiate twice, and we get squared comes out twice, I get a change of sign. So I can do a little shortcut in there. So everything I need uh, to do the shock spectra, response spectra, is there in the normal modes analysis by participation factor, by deflected uh, eigenvector level or, or shape value, and my input acceleration table. So away I go. But if I've got multiple um, degrees of freedom, then it, as I have in the plate, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. This is going through and calculating that mode by mode. And these are the, the contributing modes. Some modes are torsional modes and so on. They're not going to contribute or lateral bending modes. So here basically is the uh, shock spectra plotted here. Now, this rising part is very interesting because that's where we get dynamic um, alleviation. Because the structure can't fully respond quickly enough because it's at low frequency, during the, 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 the shock, we can actually get some mitigation or alleviation in there. Then we get to this kind of saturated level where the shock's on long enough, or sorry, the, the frequency um, responses, or the, the frequency of response is high enough that's going to actually uh, kind of absorb the higher uh, level of content. And that's basically a very typical kind of approach, a frequency dependent and then a sort of saturated level. If we can design stuff down into this um, frequency dependent uh, level re region, then we're in good shape. In fact, the first two modes here are in this kind of roll-off period here. Mode number three is in the plateau. So um, we, that, that's good news. The biggest response is actually mode number one here. So we've actually squashed the response of mode number one down. So this, this little table here summarizes the calculations that we do in here. So this is my uh, output uh, acceleration. So these are the values that I plotted in there. And that's the big one. In fact, I lied. It's mode number two. Um, so uh, that's actually the sending, second bedding mode. Now we've got this modal contribution uh, or contribution mode by mode, but what do we do with that? Um, we, we don't, we've lost the understanding of um, how those modes work together. We're not doing transients. We've just got a modal contribution. We've got to figure out some way of combining them together. Now the worst way we can do it is just add up the accelerations, the absolute accelerations. That's called the absolute method. For this little plate, it assumes 24.5 G. That means everything, every mode is in phase at some point during this shock loading. We don't know when, 
Um, but we assume at some point everything's in phase. That's as bad as you can get. So it's very conservative. A more common approach is the NRL method, Naval Research Laboratory method, which basically says take the biggest value, set that to one side, take all the rest and do uh, square them, add them all up and take the square root. So that becomes the SRSS contribution. Add the biggest value to the SRSS and that gives us um, a, a typical common approach. Now, that works many for many uh, types of shock loading. It doesn't work well for seismic analysis. There's the method we use, a CQC method or somewhat similar. So that's how we can combine all, um, all of this lot here together to say, well, you see the individual contributions, how do we add the bits up? So that's essentially uh, what, we're, what, what we are, are doing there. So, um, overrunning a little bit, but that's fairly normal. It's, um, so, um, the shock spectra, um, this is my calculation point, and my FEA result is actually ties up very well with, the, with my hand calculation. What I did was do a normal modes analysis and then said I've got all the data I need. I can pull off the actual deflected shape of that point from the normal mode, and I can use that in that calculation. I came up with a one-shot calculation down in here. So I got um, 12.76 G out, and uh, that's exactly what, what we get uh, at this point. What's interesting, though, is, again, going back to our uh, modal content, that would be a bad place to put a piece of equipment. It's not quite the worst. The worst place is somewhere in the center point in here. Um, there's some interesting regions down in here. It's kind of like a pale bluish type of value. If I put my equipment here instead, then that would be great. Um, I wouldn't have anywhere near the shock level. Why do we get that pattern? So this is showing the absolute, uh, the NRL com contributions or, or uh, combinations across the plate here. Obviously over here, we've got the basically um, uh, just the, the connected to ground. So there's not much coming through there. So this is what's happening at this point in here. Why is that a good point where I'm highlighting there? Why is that another bad point has crept in here? Well, we go back to the modal content. The first three modes here, one, two, and three, are shown in here. And that kind of gives the game away. This second mode here is the driver. And so that's the driver. We can see an influence of that on the patterning. And it's bad news on the edge here, as is mode one. Um, as is uh, as mode three. So they're all bad news on the edge there. So that really is a bad place to put a piece of equipment. But if we look at the, uh, modal, uh, the, the actual um, uh, mode shapes, we've got a nodal line with no action right through there. And fairly close to that in this mode here, somewhere around in here, we've got another nodal line. So the, the contributions from this mode and this mode are pretty well snubbed out. And this was the biggest mode. So back then to just the fundamental contribution of coming from mode number one. So there's a physical reason why that's a good good region in there. If you don't do your modal survey, you don't know what the modes look like, then it's like, well, I don't know. It's, it's a nice plot, isn't it? And that would be a good position to put the uh, the component. But why? You know, and that's, that's always the question. Now, this is a very simple um, uh, structure. I really recommend going through like a frequency response, shock spectra, uh, modal content on um, very simple models to build up understanding there. Don't be afraid to use uh, uh, simple models to kind of explore what's going on there. So there's an awful lot we can we can tease out of this type of thing. So in conclusion, um, I, uh, three types of dynamic response represent different loading environments. Um, and um, I, I'm <laughs> I haven't included the... Uh, um, the random there, which I feel very guilty about. So the two types of uh, response uh, represent different loading environments. Frequency response, just summarizing, it's all about steady red state response to a sustained harmonic loading. And the loading can be a defined spectrum, so it, it can be represent something as, somebody's done a lot of test, this particular area, and says, this is what we're likely to see. Or it can be a unit sign sweep to say, well, um, and in that first case, we're actually saying, well, what's the maximum we find across that, that kind of spectrum? Unit sign sweep is more like an investigation. We don't know quite what the sensitivity is, so we're kind of putting this thing on a virtual shaker table and see what we've got. What are the relative um, uh, resonant frequencies? How do they work together? What are their relative magnitudes and so on? So it's very much a kind of exploratory type of behavior, as opposed to the one-shot transient, uh, which, is, which is a, a one-event. 
Now, we need magnitude and phase, unfortunately, to fully define that response, and that can be, as we've seen, a little bit confusing. The shock response spectrum is generated from a series of transients. Somebody somewhere has run a series of transients. Now, it might be actual test um, uh, analysis or more likely to be test data um, from what they call an acceler accelerogram, I can never say it, an acceleration time history plot, many of them, which are then uh, turned into, again, broadened and enveloped to give us our spectrum. So more often we're taking a spectrum, and that spectrum is, is defined in the, the envelope of loading that we're likely to see. It's a very broad envelope. And what we're going to do is use that to find the peak modal contributions within the structure, um, and then we're going to combine those. Um, the low-frequency end of this uh, shock response spectra can indicate dynamic relief, so it can be designed down in that end. We, we, um, that's very beneficial. And some shock spectra also at the top end, we, we can sort of look at that spectra and say, well, we can shift frequencies around to get a better response in here. Um, we don't know any information about the phasing and the timing of the mode of contributions, so we use these different methodologies. And the NRL is perhaps one of the most popular, certainly in the fields I've worked in, Absolute is kind of, um, it's like, well, this is as bad as it gets kind of thing. And for seismic analysis, because there's a particular characteristic of the shock uh, spectra there, they tend to use uh, other methods such as, say, CQC type method. Okay. Um, so uh, Jimmy uh, asked a question on page six. Would the transient response, what would the transient response look like with only a spring and no damping? Um, coefficient in the one degree of freedom model? Would we reach steady state right away? Uh, no. Um, what happens, and uh, let me go back to that, just make sure I've got the right um, picture in my mind. I don't know a quick way of going through here, so I apologize. Yeah, I thought that was a picture we we're looking at. So basically, um, if we take out the damping in the transient, that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we're, we're pumping energy in, and remember, it's sustained is sustained input, sustained loading. So without any dissipation of energy, that, that magnitude just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. So we don't want to do a, a, a harmonic transient without any damping, otherwise we never achieve steady state. And also when we do a frequency response, we don't want to put in zero damping. Sometimes people think, well, I know light damping is uh, conservative, so if I put in zero damping, that's going to be con very conservative. Unfortunately, that gives us an infinite response at resonances. Um, if we've got multiple degree of freedom system, they kind of cross-couple, but we just get crazy um, levels in there. So we, we need damping. Damping is there in, in real life. In the shock analysis, we can get away without using damping sometimes. And in hand calculations, we would do that because it's, it's not a sustained um, loading on all that, uh, which is building up and building up. The shock loading comes on, and it goes off. And the structure's only had a very brief time to respond. So if you think of dissipation due to, uh, to uh, damping is due to cyclic, uh, these cycling events, well, we might only get one cycle or two cycles. So there's not really a chance to, to dissipate energy. So certainly for, for transient, it's pretty important that we, um, we put in that damping there in this, in this form of, of loading. Sanjay Kumar uh, said, the bumpy road load response of a car is frequency domain Y. Um, well, again, this is the motivation to go into frequency a response because if I ran, uh, I can certainly run one transient. I've got one pothole, let's say, of a particular size uh, spread along, <laughs> and um, I drive at a particular frequency. That's one transient, and I'm going to get I can, from that. I can pick off a peak response. But if I've got different um, spacing in my potholes, different size, I drive at a different speed, it's another transient. So what I'm going to do is to say, let's turn this instead into um, a, a spectrum, a, a frequency response that would be the same road and we're just driving in different frequencies. So I can see the, the sensitivity of the, uh, if you like, the speed of, to, to the peak response. Um, and that's basically why, why, why we would do that. Um, the frequency response gives us a chance to see not a one-shot solution, one transient, but potentially what's happening for a whole range of transients there. Adri says, or asks a question, sorry, on slide 21. If we were to do a static analysis with a given 4.1 g acceleration, 1.4 g acceleration, 
will that give the maximum possible response? Will it give maximum possible stress? Um, so this becomes a spectrum. Um, if we've got a um, whatever's applying that spectrum, if the frequency is high enough, of the uh, let's say the, the the structure we're applying this to, it might be that we get some kind of dynamic relief in there. Um, so the we could say, for example, um, yeah, the, the, the simple answer is no. We want to do we want to do this analysis to find out the frequency content. Otherwise, what we're faced with is to say, well, we're going to use your studio static. We were typically there, say, uh, to be safe, we would use twice. So an impulsive load um, uh, gives us a dynamic mag magnification factor of twice the, uh, the static loading. So that would be the conservative kind of approach. That's the, the simple approach we would take with their um, battery. would say 1.4 times 2, that's what's going to give us the, the response. Here, if we run um, the sh uh, shock spectra analysis, we're looking for dynamic alleviation and contribution. So it's a way of actually being less conservative than applying the pseudo static type approach. So battery kind of follow on from that. For half sine and rectangular shock pulses, the dynamic magnification factor is no higher than two, which is which is what we said there. So instead of shock response or transient, we do the static with two times acceleration. Is this the so-called statically equivalent? It is, um, and actually quite interesting on the uh, U.S. Navy DDAM method, dynamic uh, design analysis method. Um, before that, it was introduced back in the day. We would take um, a shock loading and then just basically say, okay, that's the static uh, shock loading. Let's double it, as you say, the dynamic magnification factor, and then, then we're done. Well, because of the uh, curve that we see, if I can find that curve quickly, um, that shock curve that we see there, it, if we imagine it's on a, um, uh, an axis so that, um, in fact, let's go to a different one, um, less confusing one. Here we go. So here's a shock curve we put, we put in. We, we're assuming in that case, this is like the saturated level in here. So twice the static we were operating in here. This is the interesting bit down in here. We get dynamic interaction going on. There's the whole reason for doing a uh, dynamic analysis and doing dynamic shock spectra is that for frequencies below that corner uh, frequency there, so uh, either a single degree of freedom frequencies or frequency contributions and modal contributions, we get a big alleviation coming in there. There just isn't time for the energy to build up and actually develop the full response. So that that is, is really put your finger on it. That's why we do a dynamic analysis rather than static analysis. In my advanced dynamics course, that's I spend about the first hour and a half, uh, or about the first hour, going through an example. It's a little magic trick to show that we've got a long beam with a mass on the end. If I uh, apply a shock load, I'm always going to get a higher root bending moment. Uh, sorry, if I apply a, a, a static acceleration, I'm always going to get a unit, a bigger root bending moment than a short beam. The short beam has less um, uh, less moment arm. But I can do a little magic trick there, and I can say, well, in fact, the uh, short beam has a higher frequency. So in a shock curve, it ends up here. The long beam has a lower frequency, it ends up down there. So in dynamically, I can actually reverse it. It sounds crazy, but I can actually have less load uh, being attracted into the long beam. So <laughs> come along to the course if you want to see that magic trick done. Um, I always feel like it's pulling a rabbit out of a hat there. It's very, very interesting. Simon says, could you expand on CQC method used in seismic analysis? I'm not an expert on that. I, I was involved with some programmatic and testing aspects of that when uh, when developing software. But basically, the seismic people that you can characterize an earthquake in, in a particular way, and the way that they do their combinational effect reflects the, the nature of that earthquake. I can't go much further than that, um, I'm afraid, Simon. But um, um, by all means, uh, look at CQC. There's a couple of other methods. They're specifically because there's a characteristic associated with that uh, with that earthquake uh, signal, uh, and they take advantage of that. Um, Jack, hi Jack. Uh, what's the realistic level for damping? Two percent critical damping is that high or low? Jack, I think you 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 know you're leading me astray there. Um, uh, it depends is the answer, and we all love that answer. Um, basically, um, that would be considered a fairly light level of damping. 
1% perhaps is the uh, most conservative level of damping we use. As we put um, more fabrication, more jointing in, uh, our material properties and our characteristics also in inherently have more damping associated with them, then that damping value can climb. For linear dynamics, um, uh, for example, if I'm doing composites and it's a fabricated composite as well, then I might get up to say 8%, 10%, something like that, which is a high level of damping. There's a transition in there. There's no good answer to that. We really just have to say what's um, what what would be typical we see on test, because it's only test is going to give us uh, levels of damping. Um, and the other thing is that the lower we go, uh, the more conservative we are. It's bad news to say, well, I, I don't know what the value is. Let's put in 6% critical damping. That's suppressing the response at resonance. The other point is much beyond 10%, 15%, we're starting to stray into nonlinear. We make some assumptions that our undamped and our damped uh, damping, uh, damping is, is uh, resonant frequencies are the same. Um, and we start to stray away from that when we go above 10%. Badri, you've got a question on random uh, analysis there. If I transient analysis data or transient data, should I do a random analysis or shock response, which is more accurate? Um, I guess I, I really want to come perhaps hook back to um, shock response when I talk about random. They are different things. Um, uh, the shock response is deterministic. So this is basically um, we are going to see this envelope. So every time we, um, say, hit um, a ship with a shock loading, we're going to see this envelope. It doesn't change. This is the specification. Now, our structure may change within that. And we may see different, uh, and we will see different modal contributions. But the loading stays the same. In a, um, so um, in a, a, a random, it's basically saying our loading environment is completely random. And we have a, a spectrum, but it's not really the same thing at all. It's really looking at the power content or the frequency content of that spectrum. So we have different ways of approaching that. So I don't want to kind of compare the two like that. So I can't really say which is the more accurate. But it's true to say we could run a transient instead of a, a shock response. We could also run a transient instead of a, a random response. So that's a different kettle of fish. A transient uh, um, shock would be, again, deterministic. Um, a transient random is, is going to be one event. Both of them, they suffer from the same thing. They are just one take on the particular loading environment. Um, if we look at the random, I could I probably need eight to 10 random signals to make sure I, I fully cover all the phasing and so on. Same kind of thing with a, a, a transient uh, for shock. Um, how do I know I've covered all the, the combinational effects and so on in that one transient? I don't. So the answer is yes, we can do it, but we could then have to do a lot of justification to say uh, for both of them separately, not, not comparing them, but, but separately for shock response and random response, I could run a whole bunch of transients to embrace or envelope. And that's, that's, that can be done, but it can be very time consuming to do that. I think uh, Anatoly has a similar question. Uh, could you please advise on the choice transient versus shock response analysis? When do you prefer each of them? Um, again, uh, the, the, I have done this in the past where um, I'm not happy with using a spectrum because I just got a complicated structure. Um, it, there's all sorts of modal contributions. I've I've had to combine them using an NRL type method. I lose the physical understanding of the shock response coming through. So in those cases, I've run five to six transients, which represent the typical shock spectra. Make sure that they fit underneath the shock spectra, and then I, I get a better physical understanding because the phasing, where the peak occurs, and so on, is there. You can actually generate a transient which fits into the shock spectra curve. So we can guarantee that the transient will kind of obey the, the, the spectrum here. Equally, you can do that for a um, random vibration. You can generate a sim synthetic um, transient which fits under the random vibration PSD. Those can be useful to explore. Um, but again, you need a fair number of them to make sure that um, the events are going to be covered. 
in a shop, for example, imagine you're driving along, you get one bump in your car and you, you've got a piece of equipment, and, oh, you saw that uh, maximum G loading. How do you know that there isn't going to be another bump somewhere else at a slightly different speed, which is going to give you a bigger difference? Both of those are transient events, so we want to embrace a series of transient events. Sometimes to drill down, it's a very good question, Anatoly, sometimes to drill down and get better understanding, we want to, to do that um, transient there. Um, some people have the ability to run many transients, um, just if you have that resource available and you can do that. Um, Will says, I've got an actuator that is wearing between the moving parts due to a vibration issue. How can I use modal or harmonic analysis to find the worst mode? The test data shows spikes at a higher frequency, but I'm thinking the lower modes might be the issue. Um, you could certainly run um, a frequency response analysis so that you, if you didn't know the level of um, loading going in, you just say, assume it's, it's just constant. I can then, I'm looking at the sensitivity. You could look at the sensitivity of the lower modes compared to the higher modes using our frequency response or harmonic response analysis in that particular case. Chip asks a question. The one degree of freedom frequency response plot shows this peak response at the natural frequency. The response at zero hertz is then the static response. And as the curve moves to the right, high frequency appears to taper down, implying the structure doesn't respond to high frequencies. Yes, that's absolutely right, Chip. So that, that single degree of freedom uh, response is very um, a very useful thing to look at. As you say, at low frequencies, we're basically just driving and getting a static response. There's no dynamic response. At peak resonance, it's all about, uh, for a single degree of freedom, what the level of damping is. That completely controls uh, our response. As we drive higher and higher frequency uh, driving frequencies, the energy required to get a response out gets just climbs higher and higher. So we basically drive the response out. Uh, on the uh, uh, intro course, um, there's a, a very nice equation, which actually is the equation of that curve. You can see those trends coming in. Lewis says, um, can the input of the shock load be characterized by the acceleration only? Is the frequency of the plateau needed? Um, so it, yeah, if we got this, if this was say an acceleration input, um, that is the corner frequency of what I call the plateau there. Um, uh, there are um, other ways of describing shock loading. Sometimes there's a uh, velocity-based um, curve, and you convert that to equivalent accelerations. Or sometimes there's a displacement-based curve. So the actual shock specification could be any one of those three input forms. Um, it doesn't always follow this particular curve type of approach. This is a this is a typical kind of U.S. Navy shock and other shocks I work with. Others. And I have a curve which is more my, a kind of a more interesting kind of curve here. There's like a little plateau region, and then there's a tail off down in here. That would be a typical transportation spectrum. So again, it's kind of the shape. It's the it's the interpretation of the shape. For design purposes, we're always looking at the shape of these curves and thinking where do we want to be? Can we shift to the left, shift to the right to get this this um, this uh, input acceleration down at all? Check us. Doesn't an explosion, for example, deliver a clear input for transient analysis? Why face the drawbacks of a shock response spectrum? Yes, if if we've got a characteristic explosion, if there is such a thing, it's a very clear uh, input for transient analysis, as you say. And if there's just one event, um, we characterize it that way, then that's great. The problem we have, for example, with the uh, U.S. Navy DDAM is that there isn't just one explosion the ship might see. Uh, it's going to have, and that gets quite interesting. We've got a standoff distance, and there's the, like the the, um, the direct wave, and then there's the ground wave coming off the uh, the, the floor of the um, of the sea. Different orientations of the ship, different distances. So there's a whole family of explosions there, which is why we move away from the transient. But I completely agree. If you've got one characteristic explosion, then a transient is is the best way to go. The whole idea of the shock spectra is to really say there's an envelope or there's a broad family of things that may hit us. So our loading environment is not so quite clearly defined. But if that is the case, as you say, Jack, then by all means, a transient is probably the way to go. It avoids a lot of the difficulties of the shock uh, response spectrum. So I completely agree with that.